for Advent, okay? Uh, the, this morning we're going to start our, our journey through the season of what the church calls Advent. And the Advent season is the first four Sundays before, uh, the, the first four Sundays before Christmas, and it actually ends on Christmas Eve, okay? Some of you may be familiar with Advent, some of you may not. I grew up in a church, a very uh, liturgy-oriented church, and we were familiar with, with Advent. And there's some people that aren't. The word Advent actually means getting ready or a time of preparation, so really what, Chris, what the word Advent is really telling us in the church is we're supposed to be getting ready spiritually, emotionally for the birth of Jesus Christ. And if you would turn your Bibles over to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, we're going to read a few verses here. And this is talking about a time of preparation. It says in John chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 19. It says, now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests of Levites were Jerusalem to ask him, who, oh, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They're talking about John. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophets? And he answered, no. Then he said to them, who are you? And then they said unto him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourselves? And he said, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So what was John the Baptist saying? He said, he was the one that was saying, get ready, the Messiah is coming, okay? The Advent season is a time to stir up our faith in the Lord and to remain vigilant and not lose sight of the true meaning of the Christmas season. Now, you, we've already been bombarded, okay? I've always said in America, it's pretty amazing to me, we go straight from Halloween to Christmas, okay? And we forget Thanksgiving, okay? I remember there was a day and that, you know, Meryl and I, we, I don't know if we'll get a tree up this year, but we would never put up our tree till after Thanksgiving. We just wanted to make sure we celebrated Thanksgiving. But, but so what Advent is, we're saying we're not going to get caught up in all the hoopla and forget what is the reason for all these lights, okay? The Advent wreath over here, and I will light the candle over here. The Advent wreath is composed of various evergreens as signifying continuous life. So the evergreens talk about continuous life. The wreath is also a symbol of victory, which represents the victory of that Christ won and celebrated in our daily lives. We sang a couple of songs tonight, okay? So if you'd over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, it's a wreath. It's talking about victory. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to go down in verse 53 through 57. It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought the pass to saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But look at, but look at, but thanks be to God who gives us what? Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, it's kind of interesting. In the Greek time, in the Roman times, when you won a race, they would put a wreath around your head. That was the sign of victory. So when we look at the Advent wreath over here, that's not only telling me that it's green, which is talking about the life. It's not only talking to me about, about it's a never-ending circle like God love is never ending. But that wreath is also telling us, that, you know what, folks? We win. Christmas tells us that we win. The three purple candles and the one pink candle represent the four weeks of Advent, and each week represents a thousand years. So approximately from Adam to Jesus was 4,000 years. The wreath is also circular in shape without beginning or end, symbolizing eternal life. See, you know, Christmas is much more than just putting up some Christmas tree and putting some lights. And I love our Christmas tree because I would tell you this right now. You know, and I know some people try to tell me that a Christmas tree is an old Gothic heathen thing that was started in Germany. Well, if that's what you want to make it, then that's what it is. But I tell people, when I look at a Christmas tree here, I see green, which represents life. 
When I see lights here, I think Jesus is the light of the world. When I see these beautiful red ribbons around here, I think by his stripes I was healed. I tell you, when I see a Christmas tree, I don't see anything heathen about it. I see everything about what Jesus is to us, okay? And I think it's really, really important. And we're going to talk about the four candles here, and then I'm going to have someone come up and light this candle. But the first candle we have over here, a purple candle, is the candle of hope, or the prophetic candle. The second candle we'll light next week is the candle of love, which we'd also call the Bethlehem candle. The third candle, which would be a pink candle, that is actually the candle of joy. And you know, I love the song Joy to the World. That's actually talking about the shepherd's candle. And the third pink, a purple candle is the candle of peace. And that is the angel's candle. We're going to study that when the angels came, they said peace and goodwill towards all men. And then on Christmas Eve, we'll, have, we'll light the white candle, which is actually the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. Now, you know what? I didn't know who was going to be here today. Uh, you know, so I, usually I was going to maybe assign somebody that would light the candle, okay? And I thought, I didn't know who was going to be here today, okay? So I thought, who could I ask to light the candle? They might not be here. So you know what I'm going to do? Unsuspecting to this a person, I'm going to ask Christy Rainwater to come up. Come up, Christy. Christy is our newest member here at Christ the King. Christy, bless her heart. Turn around, Christy. This might be kind of a culture shock for her. She's from Texas. Okay, hallelujah. Okay. My but, first real snow. Okay. <laughs> and Christy, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you'll come over and light this candle for me, if you just light this, this, this purple one right there. And remember, Christy is lighting the candle of hope. Hope is really, really important in life. And we need to realize that. Thank you so much, Christy. Yeah. Is, does it get this cold in Texas? Okay, you know, don't you love it how they say that white stuff? Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, we talk like Nebraskans, you know, that white stuff. Okay, you know, but she kind of makes it sound more romantic almost. Okay, you know. Uh, the first candle that we're going to talk about today is, is, is the candle of hope. We can have hope, you know why? Because God is faithful and God keeps his promises. Our hope comes from the Lord. That's what Christmas is all about. You know, for, for millenniums, they were waiting, the Jewish people were waiting for a Messiah. God had promised them a Messiah that he would come and he would be a savior that would take away all the sins of the world. And they kept hoping and hoping and hoping and maybe each year came by and they thought, not this year, not this year. But finally, the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent his son into this world, okay? And over in Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13, I love this. It says, and again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles and him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but what did the apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit talk a lot about there? Hope. Everybody say hope. hope. See, God said Christmas is about hope. And now, you know what? Sometimes Christmas is not always the most wonderful time of the year for people that have lost hope because they think everybody is joyful and everything is going good. But you know what? We need to learn to instill hope in others. We need to tell people, you know what? If, it's, if you're down on your luck, if you're down, if you don't feel good, that's okay. Have hope. God keeps his promises. Amen? Advent is all about hope. Hope of a coming Savior that would save the nation of Israel and the world from their sins. Hope is what happens before the fulfillment of God's promise. You know what, folks? See, if you have God's promise in your hand, you don't have to have hope, do you? If you got it, you don't have to hope. But you know what? If you don't have it yet, is there anybody here who's been dreaming for something they don't have yet? Come on. I think we all do. You know what you have to have? You have to have hope. See, if you don't have hope, then you think it's never going to come to pass. But once you've, once you've acquired it, once you have it, then you know what? You don't have to have hope anymore because you have it. And see, our God, you know what? Maybe you and I, I know we haven't. You know what my hope is? We're going to find everything that we have in our house. Hallelujah. You know what my hope is? Someday, actually, everything's going to be where it belongs. Hallelujah. That's what I'm hoping, okay? Until then, it's just hope, okay? There'll be a day when I won't have to hope everything's there. But God is saying, you and I are going through life. We have dreams. We have visions. We have, we have plans that maybe haven't come to fruition yet. 
then we can't give up hope. That's what happened to the nation of Israel. You know, it's really amazing. Religion is a real killer. Do you know the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all the people that wrote the scriptures? Do you know they wrote about, they knew all the prophecies about Jesus. Do you know that? They knew all the prophecies about a Messiah coming. And, but they had just gone through the motion. And then when Jesus actually showed up and actually fulfilled those prophecies, you know what they said? No, 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 no. That can't be him because we know it's going to happen someday. See, you got to have some hope that, you know what, someday is going to come today. And that you're not always just out there hoping, but hope is a great place to start, okay? See, so today as we continue in hope and our faith with Jesus Christ, you know what he's going to do? He's going to take care of us. God is going to take care of us, not only in this world, but the next. You know that? I tell you what, that's the really nice thing about it. Jesus, when Jesus died a little over 2,000 years ago, before he left, he told his disciples, he said, you know, I'm going to come back and get you. He said, if it were not so, I would not have told you. But he said, I'm going to prepare a house for you. You know what I thought? Man, the mansion that Jesus has been building for me, we don't have to move nothing here. Oh, yeah. oh my Jesus, isn't that going to be great? Hallelujah. I tell you what, we're just going to, in a twinkling of an eye, we're all going to be changed. And all of a sudden, we're all going to be taken up. I, I don't know about you folks, that's a hope for me. Sometimes this world beats me up. Sometimes it beats you up. Sometimes you think, is it ever going to get any better in life? And the devil will try to tell you no, but it will. And I don't know, maybe physically it might not always get better for us on this earth, but I have news for you. Jesus is going to take care of us. And someday... In the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is going to appear. And those that are dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive will be caught up with him in the air. And the Bible says, and we will be with the Lord forever. I don't know about your hope meter, but that should give you some hope. Hallelujah. I tell you what, it's going to be okay in life. See, folks, but hope isn't something that you and I can manufacture. We just can't try to be more hopeful. Hopeful doesn't come with the power of positive thinking. Where does hope come from? It comes from knowing and trusting Jesus. You know what I really hope in life? That our church is known in our community as a community that loves, a church that loves Jesus. I hope our church is known in our communities as, they're kind of a little overboard on Jesus over there. I want to, that's what I want to be known for. I really do in life. Because you know what folks? Jesus gives me hope. When I'm hopeless, I can turn to Jesus. You know, there's a song we used to sing in Arizona, and I love it. And it says, Lord, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you see. See, you know when I get hopeless? When I quit seeing things the way Jesus sees them. And you know what Christmas did? Christmas showed us how God saw us. And he gave the world hope. Amen? You know what? You know how we can have hope and because we can trust in Jesus? Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know what you and I are going through this week or maybe today, but isn't that a great promise? He said, I'm always going to be with you. I don't know how it happens, but you know what? If you and I were walking out in the snow today, maybe you might only see one set of footprints, but I'm telling you, Jesus is always with you. Yeah. Amen? Another promise. He says, call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. See, Jesus says, you know what? If you need some wisdom, call upon me and I'll give you that. You know what? I love the promise I talked a little bit about. Jesus said he's coming back. He's coming back again. I don't know about, you know, we don't talk enough about that in churches. See, we get very earthbound. We get very material bound. And we think this is, you know, folks, someday tomorrow isn't going to look like today. So, you know what? Someday you and I are not going to have a tomorrow. Someday when Jesus comes back, this whole thing is going to change completely. And the things that we thought were so valuable and so precious are going to seem so dim and so, I don't want to say worthless, but they don't deserve our attention See, when we see the first candle burning bright this morning, we need to realize that it's telling us never to give up. And hope is always on the way. When you look at that candle, you look and say, you know what? Because the world, the devil, our mind's going to tell you, give up hope. I tell you what, when we moved in, this is the most unorganized we've ever moved. 
Oh my Jesus, you know. And it is. I mean, we were going to move on Saturday and we saw the snow was coming Saturday. So we hurried up and got everything on Friday. And oh my Lord Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And it's a little overwhelming. And you know what Meryl and I have tried to do? Give each other hope. Let's do one room at a time. Because if you look at the whole thing, you know what you think? What's the sense? We're never going to get done. So you know what you do? You give yourself a little hope. Because once you get one room done, you know what you think? I get another room done. I get another. See, hope. And so we need, I, you know, it might seem silly to some of you. You know why? Because your house is all in order. Hallelujah. Okay. But the fact of the matter is that God is saying, get hope just a little bit. And it, it'll just grow and grow and grow. See, when we see the first candle, let's remember it's about hope. Over in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 18 and 19. It says this. That by two immutable things. And the immutable is just a fancy word that says unchanging. That's really what it means. Okay. It says it, in which it is impossible. See, there's two things that God cannot do. You know, you all say, everybody says God can do anything. No, he can't. It tells us God cannot lie. Aren't you glad about that? Don't you wish everybody was that way that God couldn't lie or that they didn't lie? See, the Bible says God cannot lie. So we need to know a promise gives us hope. If Jesus said, I'm going to come back, then we know he can't lie. If he says, look up unto, from which to come with your help, your help coming from the Lord, we know the Lord's going to help. See, he can't lie. See, I don't know about you, but that should give us hope knowing we can trust in his promises, okay? That it's impossible for God to lie that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. What is hope? Hope is an anchor to our soul. I tell you what, folks, you know what is hard? It's hard to be solid in a shifting world. Come on. It's hard to be solid in a shifting world. What they say is once acceptable is now unacceptable. What was once unacceptable is now acceptable. Do you understand? It's hard to be solid in a shifting world. So we need to have an anchor to our soul. And you know what that anchor to our soul is? The Bible says hope. I tell you what, it doesn't matter how the, the landscape is shifting. If we have hope in Jesus, we can be firm in that foundation. Amen. See, during Advent, we wait for the fulfillment of God's promise. That Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, is coming back. See, Jesus came, now get this. Jesus came this time as a baby. When he comes back again, folks, it's as a judge and a king. Okay? But he's coming back. We hold to God's promises that Jesus is coming back. He's going to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be no more tears, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain. I don't know about you. Sounds pretty doggone good to me. Think about that. No more tears. No more sorrows. No more pains. No more crying. Pardon me? Yeah. No brown boxes. Oh yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. There you go, Bob. I don't know about you folks. That gives me great hope. See, I look, I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I hear people say, I can't wait to get to heaven. Yes, I can wait to get to heaven. Okay. If I couldn't, if, I, if I'd say I can't wait to get to heaven, I'd just go out on Highway 12 and walk around until a car hits me. Okay, hallelujah. I, I can wait to get to heaven. But I look with heaven with great fondness. That someday I'm going to go there. And all the wrongs will be righted. All the tears will be wiped away. All the sorrows will be healed. All the pains will be extinguished. I don't know about you folks. That gives me hope. That gives, and that's what this first candle is about. I tell you, it's more than just having a religious order up here or lighting a candle because it's Advent. This candle is telling us we have hope. Having hope doesn't mean we'll not go through hard times or difficult times. It just means we won't let those hard or difficult times consume and direct our life. You know what? We need to really reach out this Christmas season for the people around us. I, for people that it's the hardest, the ones that have lost a loved one are by themselves. Because especially if they're by themselves, they don't have any hope. And you know what? 
I think it'd be wonderful, maybe if we know some people in our community, maybe invite them over to a meal. Do you understand? Do you know that during the Christmas season, the holiday season, it's one of the highest rates of suicide? It's supposed to be a joyful time. But see, people have lost hope. I'm looking at a group this morning called People of Hope. You guys have hope because of Jesus. Amen? Why? We have hope in a God who will correct all the injustices, who will comfort all the sorrows, who will bring light into all the darkness, who will inject love where hate once reigned, he who will empower those who seem too weak to walk, and will cause hopelessness to bow to hope. You know what the Bible says? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. I don't know what you and I are going through in life, but I tell you what. Whatever the best the devil can throw at you and I, it has to bow to the lordship of Jesus Christ. See, folks, that candle tells me I have hope it's going to happen. Hallelujah. Maybe it doesn't happen today. Maybe it doesn't happen tomorrow. But I tell you what, my Jesus keeps his promises and it will happen. We just need to stay and believe that he is going to do what he said he would do. Amen. The difference between hopelessness and hope is not just a belief in Jesus, but it's in a living relationship with him. You know, you've heard me say this before. Just because you walk in a barn don't make you a cow. Just because you park in a garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you walk to the doors of a church doesn't make you a Christian. You know what? We all need a living, vibrant, vibrant relationship with Jesus. We need to talk with Jesus every day. We need to communicate with him every day. We need to thank him every day. You know, all we have, folks, all we have is a direct result of Jesus. You know, I've heard people say, well, I don't believe that. I worked hard. You know, I tell people, who gave you the health to get up in the morning to go to work, to earn the living that you have, that you can accumulate the things you have? I promise you, if you think that you're, you did it all, Let God take away his hand of blessing off you and you'll find out what you and I have is not much at all. And we need to realize that in life, okay? The difference between that is what? Having a a relationship with Jesus. It's the difference between trusting in God's promises and having no God at all. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I can hope and trust in him. Now I want us to go over to Luke chapter 1. This is a story about hope. Okay, this is about Zacharias and Elizabeth. And this is actually Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. Okay, and over in Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 8, please. And it says, so it was that while he was serving as priest, this is Zacharias, before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside of, at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing in the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias. I love this one. Look at, do not, no, look at what the angel tells him. For your prayer is heard. Zacharias and Elizabeth are old people. They were barren. They didn't have a child. They have been praying and praying, Lord, give us a child. Why is it we pray that don't have kids? Lord, give us a child when we have kids. Oh, Lord, you can take them. Hallelujah. Okay. I don't know what it is. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But I want you to know, see, there's hope. Zacharias and Elizabeth have been praying for years for a child. And it seemed like God didn't hear them. It seemed like they weren't going to get their answers. But look what he said. For your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. For your prayer has been heard. Do you hear that promise? I want to give you hope today. Maybe you've been praying for something, has it come to fruition, has it come to pass? I want you to know, see the devil, our mind, maybe other people try to tell you, it's useless of praying. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, pastor, I came up for prayer and I didn't get healed. I guess, no, I tell people, I keep coming up every Sunday and getting prayer. I'd get it until I, until I saw that manifestation in my life. I'd keep going because God will keep his promises, Amen. See, Elizabeth and Zacharias, they were both faithful servants of the Lord who had, who had served God their whole lives. But they had no children, yet they kept coming back to the temple and worshiping even though their lives were difficult. 
You know, see, this is where most people miss their promises. When things get rough, they say, forget the church. Ever heard anybody like that? You know, I believe God. I prayed once and this happened and it didn't work out. So I, I'm not going back. Ever heard that before? I have. But look what Elizabeth, you know what? It's like an analogy with the football game. You know, it's easy to run between the 20s. It's when you get down to the red zone, that's when it gets a lot tougher in life. And you know what, folks? It's easy to come to church and pray and have your hands in the air and worshiping God when things are going your way. But how about when things aren't going your way? How about if maybe you just got a bad report from the doctor? How about maybe you just lost your job? How about maybe this didn't happen? I tell you what, it's like the Zacharias and Elizabeth. They're still coming to church. They say, you know what? I don't care what the circumstances say. God gave me a promise and I have hope. And even though maybe my whole world around me seem to be falling apart. I can still lift up my hands. I can still praise and say because I have hope that God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen? You've heard me say this before. God is never late. He just misses a lot of great opportunities to be early. Okay? God is never late. Okay? They persevered in serving God. They believed that God's promises were true and one day because they believed God's promises were true. One day an angel showed up and said, you know what, Zach? We've been hearing your prayers and now you're going to have those prayers answered. How, what kept a mom, what kept a woman, a man, kept, keep them praying hope that God did hear their prayers? I don't know, have you ever, th- come on now, have you ever said, why should I pray? Nothing's going to happen. Come on. Why should I pray? Nothing's going to happen. You know what? That's when we become hopeless, haven't we? Come on, I've been there. And we need to say, you know what? We are going to pray because something is going to happen. Because my God says, I not only hear your prayers, but I answer your prayers. And sometimes the the time between hearing and answering, you know what it's going to take? Hope. That God hears those things. See, obviously, Zechariah, for all of his faithfulness, Though he struggled to believe God had hurt him. Why? Because God had promised to, oh, why did he struggle? Because he didn't think God was hearing his prayers. But God had heard his prayers. And you know, I got to ask a question to you today. Do you trust that promise that God hears your prayers? What are you praying for today? What are you asking God for today? As we get ready for this new year, what are you going to ask God for in 2019? What is it that you're praying for? Maybe a child like Elizabeth. Maybe a paycheck that stretches to the mortgage and the groceries. Maybe peace in your heart. God has heard your prayers. But you know what he says? You need to fill in the blank. See, you know, there's a wonderful scripture in Psalms 37, 4. Psalm 37, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. You know, there's too many people. They have what I consider the Doris Day theology. Who knows? There's too many young people. They don't even know who Doris Day is. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Who knows who Doris Day is? Yep, you're older than me. Okay, yeah. Doris Day sang a song, K sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not mine to see. K sera, sera. That's how people, a lot of people live their Christian life. They just think, well, whatever will be, will be. No, God says, you and I have something to say about it. We're just not these poor victims just kind of going by in the universe and just hoping that God is kind to us. God says, you have something to say about what happens in your life. And I believe that. It's not that we're ordering God around. No, we're not ordering God around. But God says, you have something to do about it. I was reading my Bible the other day, and it's amazing. Somebody came up to Jesus, you know, somebody said about healing. Well, you know, about healing. And you know what? It's amazing. Healing, I think I've counted seven different ways that God heals in the Bible. But one way, Jesus said to one person, get this, your faith has made you whole. Now, obviously, that guy had something to do with his healing. Jesus didn't, and then another one, Jesus said, you know what? The faith of your friends have made you whole. Another one, he sent his word and healed. Another time he laid hands on him, they healed. Another time he anointed with oil. See, I don't care how you get healed. But sometimes we do have something to say about it. Your faith, Jesus said, that person has made you whole. In verse 13 there, in, in, uh, in Luke it says, and, he's, and the angel says, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. With this promise that Elizabeth and Zachariah received, they had new hope. 
You know what? When God promise you when you when you when you actually achieve a promise you know what it does it gives you more hope to believe for something else see god wants us to have hope do you know how do you know god's promises for you see that's why we really do need to read the bible because there are promises in here there's i i think i read somewhere there's like six thousand some odd promises in here and you know what if we don't know the promises how can we ever hope for them and then all of a sudden, we're just kind of saying, well, whatever. No, God says, read the book, find out what promises are, and then have hope that his word will, re- will not return void in your life, okay? This is one of the most important reasons to study the scripture. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So what is God telling us? We're supposed to study the Bible, are you kidding me, Pastor Jeff? You're so, I mean, you're not supposed to get the Bible out. You mean that's not just supposed to be sitting on my coffee table collecting dust? Hallelujah. Yes. You're supposed to actually get it out. And so I've heard people say, well, I just don't like reading. Then get DVDs. Get CDs. Get the Bible on audiobook. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whatever it is, get it. We live in a, in a communication era where we don't have an excuse not to. Because the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. We need to realize as we study, we can find out what is ours according to God's promises. By reading and memorizing and learning God's word, we begin to know God's promises to us. And when we start to realize what God has promised us, you know what starts to rise in our lives? Hope. When you and I start knowing God's word, we start to have hope. My Bible, did anybody actually today in the devotional? It was about, I've been young and I've been old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging for bread. You know, I don't know about you, but you know what? As I read the Bible, I can have more confidence in Jesus. He's going to take care of me. But you know what? If I don't know what his promises are, then I don't know what he'll do for me. And if I don't know what I have, he'll do for me, you know what I have? I'll not have any hope in him. But the more I find out what he's doing for me and what he'll do for me, I have hope that he's going to keep. Remember, Hebrews said, God is immutable. God cannot lie. He will take care of us. You know, I, I think, you know, here in our own church, and I know, I know uh, for the Taylor clan, it'll be a little tough Christmas with Twyla gone. But I tell you what, God was faithful to Twyla. You know what God made? God made a promise to Twyla, said, I will take care of you. And you know what? On that day when Twyla gave up her last breath, you know what happened? To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And in that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, Twyla Taylor went from pain and suffering and in a hospital to the presence of Jesus in heaven. And there's no more, t- you know what? He was faithful to her in his promise to always take care of her. And we all have loved ones like that. Yes, we'll miss them. We'll mourn for them. But I got news for you folks. You know what they're not doing today in heaven? Shoveling snow. (laughs) You know what they're doing today? They're walking on streets of gold. We're walking on ice. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Don't feel sorry for Twyla, hallelujah. Okay, she's having the time of her life, okay? See, Zachariah believed his family would end. See, Zachariah thought, if God's ever going to hear me, he thought his, his, his family line would end, yet God gave him a son. What has the devil told you is going to die? You know what I tell you? Stop listening to the devil and start listening to God and let hope arise. We, we, see, we get a choice every day. We're going to listen to the world. We're going to listen to the devil. We're going to listen to God. That's our choices. You know, you look out there and the, and the economy will say this and that. I, I know this. My Bible says, my God will supply my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It said nothing about the stock market. Right. You know that? God, you know what? And, when, and you know what? In Israel, there was a great famine. You know what God did? He took care of the Elijah the prophet, bringing the ravens. And then he went to a widow in, uh, and, and Zarephath. And all of a sudden, they had the crews of oil and the, and the, and the barrel of, of flour. And they, see, our God said, he's going to take care of us. I'm looking, none of us look like we're starving. We're all eating healthy. See, God made us a promise. And we need to realize, if God, you know what gives me hope? God has taken care of Marilyn and I in our past. He's taken care of us in our present. And I can look at his track record in my life. And if God has taken care of me in my past, my present, you know what I know he's going to do for me? He's going to take care of me in my future. I have hope in that. And that's very important. See, Christmas is based on hope. Because the fulfillment of prophecies is the fulfillment of hope. Christmas is a time of hope 
and joy. Just like Zacharias and Elizabeth's new hope wasn't just for them. What happened? It was, it, we must spread it, hope for those around us. See, when John the Baptist was born, it wasn't just for them. John the Baptist, remember, he, at the very beginning I read in John 1, he says, he was a messenger preparing the way of the Lord. See, when God gives us hope and joy, for it's just not for us. It's to share with the people around us. And it's very, very important. Jesus, see, is not only our Redeemer. He's not only our Savior. He's not only our Lord. He's not only our friend. He's not only our Master. You know what he really is? He's also my hope. He's my hope. And when I gaze upon that burning candle over there, I know that hope is mine. I tell you what, this year, if, you have, if you're having a bad day at home, get a candle out and light it. Get a candle out. You get one of those, uh, what are all those other uh, candles and just say, you know what, Mr. Devil? I have hope. Get that candle and light it. And if you have to carry that around with you, that's going, to be a, uh, that's going to be a reminder for you to say, you know what? God has promised to keep his word. And I'm going to do it. God is going to keep his word. Amen. Why don't we stand up, please? Thank you, Jesus. And the worship team, yeah, you can come up. That's fine. Lord, I thank you for this candle of hope. Lord, we are a light in a dark world. You said in Matthew that we are the light of the world through you. And Lord, that light is that, that candle represents hope here this morning, Lord God. That when we go to work tomorrow, when we're with our neighbors, with our families, with friends, Lord God. Maybe when we're buying groceries at Walmart. We're going to let our light shine. And Lord, we're going to instill hope in people's lives that seem to be hopeless. That Lord God, that we have something to be proud of, something to be excited about. Jesus, you keep your promises. And as we study your word, Lord God, let those promises jump off the pages of the Bible and into our hearts. That we can trust you with our future. And all God's people said,